Hello dear ones, it's, it's Alice. I am of the stars and I'm here today to talk a little bit about the revelation of John the Divine. Chapters 5 and 6 today and so it's it's getting more interesting in every every chapter John the Divine and the Revelation. He had an amazing vision. So first I'd like to talk a little about chapter 5. And that is is a lengthy description of the book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. So the book of the seven seals, it's pretty famous. And um, and that's, this whole chapter is about um, how sacred that book is and how, for instance, it says, uh, uh, in verse 3, it says, And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, he says in the next verse, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. So, there's, there's quite a build-up here. There's a lot of suspense created in this chapter about this book and what's in it and how important it is. And... Um, the next interesting bit has to do with what he calls the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David. And, and it, it was the Lion of the tribe of Judah that, that transforms, apparently, to the sacrificial lamb and that it has found worthy to open this book and read it. So, so he, uh, let us say, maybe he is a, he is a prophet, of, of Judah and um, and he sees he sees in the quality of these this long line of, of wonderful prophets of the tribe of Judah he sees two qualities one is courage the quality of a lion and the other is to be the lamb the sacrificial lamb um, let's see how he says it in verse 6 he says, A lamb, he describes a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. So, so somebody opens this. And, and maybe this is John the Divine in this instance, one of a long line of prophets and seers of Judah. I think when he says sacrificial lamb, what he means is, he's speaking in general about prophets and seers, first that they must have the courage to speak God's will to, um, in this world of duality where God's will is not greatly honored. And so that takes great courage and, and, and sacrifice. And so just one other thing about that, and the interesting thing, harking back to ancient Egyptian times, it has to do with the Hathors that visited Earth back then, and again in the time of Christ, the Hathors um, of Sirius, the, the constellation Sirius. Uh, they were also thought to be, to have two qualities. One was the quality of Sekhmet, the, um, the lioness who guarded humankind from all kinds of, of dangerous astral beings. And the other was the quality of, of the calf, the sacred calf, or heifer. Yeah, the sacred heifer, um, which was a nurturing symbol. So, uh, interestingly enough, these are brethren of the stars, the Hathors had this kind of quality as well, the quality of, of, of courage of a lioness and the quality of, uh, or protection of a lioness and the quality of, of sacrifice and nurturing. Um, so that's an aside. <laughs> Let's see here now. Well, I have another 
a cider um, comparison to make in the following verses. Uh, the lamb takes up the book, and 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 the the tune. Everyone around the throne. You remember from the last chapter, all of the um, sages and angels and all of the wonderful beings worshiping God around the throne. Uh, they're here in this chapter too. And they say about this lamb who takes up the book, they say, and when he had taken the book, this is uh, verse 8, the four beasts, you remember the four beasts, and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And now verse 9, and they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, and tongue, and people, and nation. Now in the time of John to the Divine, I think, um, there were quite a few Christians, followers of Christ, who had already fallen as martyrs uh, to the Word, to, to spreading the Word of God. And so uh, there was a special meaning here for those people, I think, um, because, it, it, because this verse speaks of, of the act of dying as, uh, as, a, as a, a chance to redeem the people of Judah to God through blood, okay? And so, so we have layered onto this the, the, the uh, understanding that they had in that day of the crucifixion of Christ as such an act of redemption, followed by the blood of the martyrs, of which there were oh so many during that time. The, they were following in Christ's footsteps and and through their, their act of love in the face of um, violence and injustice, uh, facing the order of things as they were in that day, they were hoping to offer an example that would, in, that would uplift all of civilization in that time, and particularly the tribes of Judah of which they, with which they identified. So layered on top of that, we have another understanding of this, this transformation of the uh, Lion of Judah, on the spirit of David the Conqueror. Remember how David and his army slew 50,000 followers of the god Baal, the, carpenter, the earliest carpenter god, Baal of Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia right? Did I get that right? <laughs> And so we have the spirit of the lion in, in David who conquered all those other tribes in the tradition of, of Judah, in the land of um, Israel. And then we have this act of a conquest by the Romans, you know, the Romans who actually killed and martyred Christ and then um, I think the, the scribes and Pharisees had a lot to do with many of the martyrdoms of the early Christians and apostles. So it wasn't just the conquerors that did this, but it was the, um, it was the Pharisees. It was actually the holy men of, 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 um, uh, of the Jewish tradition of that time who had a lot to gain by making sure that they kept their position of power, you know. And, and they probably took sides in many cases with the Roman conquerors in uh, quelling what might be considered an uprising of sentiment or uh, a threat to their power of the followers of Christ in those days. So with this notion of being willing to stand by uh, a transformative notion for the world uh, with our own, even to our own death, um, we come into a, a further understanding of the Lamb, the Lamb as, as love, 
uh, the rising, the, the lion as the third chakra, the navel point, the center of will, where that had sustained civilization for long ages, and the lamb as the moving upward of the of the energy of of humankind of that day from the third chakra, which at the best was only about justice, uh, and at the worst was was to do with um, con conquest and killing and whoever was the strongest being the one that got the right got his way, you know. So the, from the third chakra to the fourth chakra, the, the progress of all humankind to a, a greater uh, understanding of the spirit of, of humanity at that time. So in the heart, in the heart is the blood pump of the body, right? And, and in the idea of, of sacrifice is the notion that our hearts, our own hearts when we feel them, um, move out in compassion to all the world and encompass the whole world, not just our own, our own self, our own, our own good well-doing, our own family. But, 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 it, but, it, but look at looking out for everyone through this awareness here. So a, a transformative notion for the civilizations of the whole world is what this this change from the lion to the lamb is about. And and we'll see how that is borne out, that figurative way of speaking is borne out when the seals are broken in the next chapter. <laughs> um, but before we go on to that chapter, there's just one more aside I wanted to, to bring up or, or discussion I'd like to make. And that has to do with, uh, first with, with a verse we've already read, which said, describes the lamb as having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth, right? And then skipping down to uh, the 11th and 12th verses of this chapter, uh, we get down to the point where, I, I mean, I missed some of this, but this, this is the part that struck my eye <laughs> in this chapter. Um, everyone is exclaiming about the, about the lamb being in a position to, to break the seals, which is about to happen, and to, to read from the book. And, and so here's part of that explanation in 11 and 12, these verses. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands and thousands. And now verse 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. So, so we have several instances of the, of the mention of seven here. Remember from before, seven candlesticks and the seven churches and the seven angels of the churches, remember that? And now we have uh, the lamb with its seven horns and seven eyes and the seven spirits of God. And then skipping down to what was just read, we have seven things that the lamb is worthy to receive. Power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. So, so this lamb, who is this lamb? Are we this lamb? Was John the Divine this lamb? Were the apostles who were slain this lamb? Were, is, was Jesus Christ this lamb? Was he the first fractal of this lamb? The first presence of this lamb on earth? The, the reinvented carpenter God. Do you remember Baal, the one that was the first carpenter God? And the, the people of, of, who worshipped Baal, how they were all exterminated by, by David. And here is, here is Christ, 
then coming along another carpenter who was the son of God and who was slain by those who had conquered um, uh, the Jews and and probably I think they, that the that the ruling elite of the Jews put put the conquerors up to it yes so an interesting an interesting thing to say that that person who is who is transformed to a new way of consciousness is worthy of perhaps perhaps these are the seven um, spirits of God but I'll find out that for you I'll, I'll do my best but but at least willing to receive all these wonderful things that that people thought they could receive before through the power of the sword, didn't they? Power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, and glory and blessing. All these things that they sought through might in the past now can be attained much more easily through the power of love, which is aligned with the Spirit of God. Huh. Well, at least so I read all this. And, and we'll just, I thought I would read the, the last verse in this chapter because it's so beautiful. It's in praise of God, and it goes like this. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. <laughs> a beautiful chapter. <laughs> and in a, just a moment, we'll go on to the next chapter. All right, on to chapter 6 in Revelation uh, by John the Divine. And in this chapter... Um, the Lamb of the tribe of Judah opens the first six seals of the Book of Seven Seals. I spent some time looking at all this, and my feeling is that the seals represented, or could be considered, one way to look at them is to, is to feel that they represent the way that things had been going for the tribe of Judah in the recent past. Okay. Um, or maybe the whole history of the tribe of Judah. Because as the seals are broken, it starts to unfold like that history, and it goes like this. The first seal is broken, and John sees a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Well, you might say this is the early history of humankind. There were a lot of, of conquering, conquering hordes and fighting of tribes and so forth. You might say it was the history of, of the tribes of, of Judah because, because there was an awful lot of, of, um, of uh, tribal warfare in the early days. And so I think from there, and you might also say that it was the conquest of, of uh, Judea by the, the Romans. So that past history of civilization, according to the way they knew it, was a history of conquering conquest. Okay. Now, on to the second seal. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. All right, so this is the tendency of, of civilized people to kill each other. This is the, the lack of, of a peaceful mind in the world. Okay, so even after a conquest, yet there will be killing, brother killing brother, and all that, and, and the need for justice, which is what's coming next. This is the third seal. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, 
And lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. So here we have justice, do we not? We have a, a civilized way of treating maybe the law, the law of, of a civilized land or a wise king that, that allows for, for, for fair trade, you know, for, for processes of law, for a natural balance to take place, for commerce to take place in an orderly fashion. And these are the hallmarks of a peaceful civilization, are they not? Now, moving on to the fourth seal. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. So here we have death. This is a, a very natural part of the experience in the third dimension, is it not? The, the constant rounds of death and rebirth. And I know it doesn't say right there in the Bible that, that this has to do with reincarnation. It, it's a foreshortened point of view here that, that all of these difficult situations in the third dimension, the conquering, the killing, the need for justice and enforcing some kind of social order are followed by something pretty unfortunate, and that is death and, and hell, you know. And so, so there's cause for concern about the nature of this dimension, this third dimension, is there not? There are complaints because we are pure spirit, and this notion, all these notions of difficult things of this nature, they're not really um, true to the nature of our soul. They're more like what some of the seers call um, the duality experiment. The, the question was, how could the soul, which is love, experience something as far as possible from the truth of itself and the truth of God and so, they say, the earth experiment took place, right? And, and here we have people, a, a, a seer of, of great, um, like, great insight into the, 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 the bigger picture for this dimension, saying, here are these things, these completely uh, untenable things happening all around me, he says, Things that jar against the very nature of God are happening every day, everywhere, all around me. All of the people, all of the great followers of Christ are suffering greatly or have been murdered by the, by the, the, the people that are just very, uh, they're the, the the darkness really has, has, has seen an end to all of these people. And so the question arises that's answered with the next seal. That's the fifth seal, and it goes like this. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So they're asking, 
You know, they believed in Christ. They believed in, the, in turning the other cheek. They believed in love. And these people who have passed on and are now on the astral plane, they're asking, what has happened? What is going on? And this is a question that has been asked for 2,000 years now, has it not? As all of these horrible things have continued to escalate on Earth, yes, there has been conquest by the mighty. Yes, there have been killings, not only by nations, but by human beings against other human beings everywhere. There has been, there has been genocide, has there not? There have been these, these berserker killings of the school children. There have been murders, man against man and man against wo woman. There has been a, abuse by men of, of weaker people, weaker men of women and of children. There have been uh, you know, the newspapers are full of this stuff. There's been a lot of this stuff still going on, right? So this is a question still valid today. Um, and this, this business about commerce, this attempt to, to maintain an even keel, despite all of the dis darkness of the third dimension, uh, is, is another issue. How do we maintain, how do we maintain the common good? During these, uh, during these times. And so the only beef I have with this section has to do with avenging blood. And I'm not really in favor of avenging blood. In fact, I don't think Christ was in favor of avenging blood either. And so probably this and the, and the martyrs, I don't think they were in favor of avenging blood or they would have carried on and fought in the first place, right? So. Probably this section that says describes a desire for vengeance has to do with the people that were still on earth and to whom John was writing. That's my guess. <laughs> it's just a guess. So anyway, and so on to the sixth seal. Well, um, the sixth seal is sort of an answer to this question, how long? And, and the sixth seal is something that hasn't really hasn't really happened until these times. So there's been like a 2,000 year hiatus when things have gone from bad to worse in some regards. And especially with regard to something not mentioned in this chapter, stewardship of the earth, right? We've done a pretty abominable job of taking care of the earth. <laughs> not, not us personally, but just it seems that's what the way things have gone. Um, so, but, and on the bright side there, there was a, a Hathor meditation by Tom Kenyon and his group just, uh, was it last week or so, sometime this month, that was uh, facilitated by star brethren and angels and just uh, a host, just like this host that was described in the last chapter, uh, the chapter that says, um, around the throne, the angels numbering 10,000 times 10,000. It was like that this last month, apparently, described by Tom. I'll see if I can find that for you. that was successfully um, accomplished by a, a great number of people on Earth this last month was just that, to protect the stewardship of Earth and to bring Earth back to balance, which is very cool. A total aside, I'll go on. <laughs> I'll go on with the last seal. Um, so, uh, the desire for vengeance, and boy, it seems that the sixth seal, I haven't got to the seventh seal, um, which is going to be in a future video. The sixth seal, uh, it, things are not looking so wonderfully terrific, and, and the call for vengeance has been fulfilled. Um, and it goes like this. <laughs> uh, chapter, I mean, verses 12 and following. And I beheld, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. 
and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. So, so what he's saying is that, that in the process of, of regaining this balance um, on earth, that there will be so many changes that we won't even, that it, it will seem uh, that, that it's a disaster. <laughs> It'll seem like that. It's not a disaster, but it's going to seem like that because everything new is so very different, right? And we won't be able to recognize the natural order of things because the new order is a completely different and a completely more beautiful order. And so... For a while, we may lose our footing. We may lose our, our vision and understanding of what is going on. Just as he says in a kind of figurative sense, he says, um, you know, that you might as well think that, the, the, that the, the sky has changed and everything that we're used to is, is ended and the earth can't be trusted anymore, like an earthquake, you know, is happening. But, but in truth, in my understanding and that of the seers that I'm aligned with, what is really happening now is that the, the mental mind is getting such a shake-up that it seems like nothing is exactly the same in there. Now, if we look carefully, as I have admonished in many blogs, we will find that our feet are still on the ground, right? That the sky is still in the looking the same up there. The clouds and the sun and the beautiful blue, the moon, everything is still there except when there's an eclipse or something. <laughs> the earth and the sky are the same. And if we look in the eyes of our friends, we will find that they are the same great spirits that they always were. But our minds are not making a lot of sense of all this right now. Off and on, when we get what they call a, a re re reboot, or a mental reboot, or a um, uh, upgrade of the software of our mind to a greater understanding of all that is, for a little bit of time, it may seem that that nothing makes sense, that nothing is the same, and that we can't count on anything. So at those times, let us have the greatest faith, huh? Let us be solidly on earth and in faith. So, <laughs> now this next little bit in this chapter is the ending bit that I'm going to talk about. I kind of like it, and it goes like this. Verses 15 to the 17th and last verse. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the fetch just thundered. <laughs> Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him, that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? So, to me what's happening here is he's saying that, that people who rely on might, okay, and uh, power, at this moment are going to be Reevaluating their position, okay, and and they will feel that the that the wrath of the Lamb of God is is coming down upon them. But the truth of the matter is that they at this time, at this moment in time, they are clearing their own wrath, and so it it seems like uh, something they're projecting onto the onto the transforming agent, the lamb, but in fact it's their own wrath that's leaving and clearing from their own hearts and their own hearts that are coming into the, the glory that, that, that they will be knowing in this new dimension, the fifth dimension, the kingdom of God. <laughs> so, yeah. well, I, 
it's a good idea to go to the wilderness I anyway, um, just for the wonderful tranquility of it, isn't it? During times when we're when we're going through transformational change, but. I'm not so sure about hiding from the face of God because the face of God is what mm, allows us to remember who we really are too. <laughs> Y'all take care. Love you lots.